I want to say before I start that the research and the, the, the medical uh, translation of this research has been the product of several thousand individuals. It's all teamwork. So I'm one of those individuals. So you should understand that <clears throat> this work is, actually has many contributors, and uh, I often get to speak to it, I think, because I'm the oldest. <laughs> so it's many, many other people have contributed what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about brain plasticity, and I'm going to talk about the marvelous thing that we now understand about our brains that we didn't clearly understand not so many years ago. And that is that it's continually changing itself physically, continually changing itself functionally is how we engage it in the world. In fact, we now know that of the 40 or so trillion connections between nerve cells in the brain, we know that they're all plastic. That is to say, they're all subject to changing their strengths or actually they come and go in their life, in the lifetime of nerve cells, our, the brain, our physical and functional machine that controls us, that defines us operationally, is actually built from trillions of moments of change. Now, one of the really amazing things that that accomplishes for us is it differentiates us, because none of us have the identical path through life, and certainly none of us have an identical internal life. Each one of us is unique, made a unique product with, a, in a sense, a unique machine in our head. A unique person is created by these processes. No one like you ever was. No one like you, just like you, ever will be. Sort of a miracle. What a gift. But beyond that, the capacity of the brain to change itself as a function of how we engage it is a tremendous gift that we all need to understand more about. Because, in a sense, change is under our own control. Because change is very much a function of where we carry our brain. And this, this is basically what I want to talk about today. Each time we acquire any significant ability, our brain actually revises itself on a large scale. Well, here's a very simple example of a skill that almost everyone in the room has achieved. You've acquired the ability to read. And if we look down in the brain of a reader, we see that they have a reading brain. So what we're seeing in the panel on the top, the brain on the top, are areas of activity that differ in the brain of someone that's acquired the ability to read, as contrast to the brains of the children at the bottom who could not acquire it, or who did not yet acquire it. And we see these zones of activity that distinguish the reading brain, now operating in a different way as a machine from the brain at the bottom. So in this more posterior area, for example, this area, we know the fundamental association between the sound parts of words that bear meaning in words and those squiggly little visual symbols that represent them. That's the primary act of reading. It's a listening to visual translation at high speed. We know that that primary translation is being generated in this area. In this more anterior area that I've highlighted, in this area, we know that activity is very highly correlated with the accurate interpretation of the meaning of written words, and so forth. And I could actually identify six or seven clearly, uh, clearly in, engaged areas in the brain of a reader that are simply not engaged in, in all the same way in a non-reader. And we can see that by contrasting the relative lack of activity in these same zones, in the same behaviors seen in these children that struggle so hard to read. Now, it turns out it's pretty simple in most children that can't read to train them, to basically to engage their plastic brain to change itself to enable the successful initiation of reading. In this particular study, the brain at the bottom actually represented 20 children that were matched in age and, and, and in other ways to the 20 children above, and with about 20 to 25 hours of intensive training on a computer, 17 of these 20 children acquired the ability to read and were reading at a grade level or above in, within a year. Now, what's interesting about that acquisition was that none of them were trained to read. What they were trained to do was to sharpen the way they represented word sounds. Remember I said that the reading is a translation between the sound parts of words that bear meaning in their orthographic representations, letters, in the alphabet. Most, the problem that most children have that struggle to read 
is that they have an inadequate and effective representation of sound parts of words. Now, it turns out that in almost every neurological condition, there are deeper reasons why you are failing in your neurological operations that are expressed given your condition or given your illness. And understanding that deeper neurology is absolutely crucial for understanding how to drive the brain in correction. Now, in this case, training these children in this listening ability resulted in their acquisition of a reading brain. So we look at their brain immediately after this training, and we see now we're activating these areas that relate to the meanings of words going by, or that relate to making this fundamental translation. We also see this strong zone of activation just below this circle. This occurs in every child learning to read. In the initial point in which this acquisition of the relationship between those sounds and the letters is acquiring. We know that three months later or so, two or three months later, this activity has moved up into this region just as in any other normal, successful normal reader. So can many, this as in many conditions, neurological limitations or neurological distortions can be recovered from by appropriately gauging the brain to change itself. Change itself in a re normal word, renormalizing a recovering direction. Now, from all of those behaviors, from all of the ways that you've engaged your brain, thousands of abilities that you've acquired in life, you're, the operational person that you are has been created. So you're, you're good at many, many things that you're challenged by in a modern culture. And the sum of all of those things that you've acquired the ability to deal with in controlling your operations into the world, model of which you've also generated in your brain by interacting with it, is the operational person that you are. But there's something else that's created in the course of this process that in a sense is even more wonderful. And that's the creation of a captain for the ship. It's the creation of the central, central organizer controlling force that's going to control the attentional person that you are. It's going to generate the you. And it does that because the way the brain is, is constructing your model of the world is through association of things that occur in each little moment of time. It's basically building your construct or your model of the world by the, constructing those associations by plasticity. And also, from those associations, it's very powerfully predicting the next expected successive event. It's also constructing a stable understanding of the way things are related or move across the dimension of time. Every time it constructs one of these associations, and it's literally up to this billions of times a year, every time you have a feeling, every time you have a thought, every time you act, it's making a second association. And the second association is to the source of the feeling or thought or action. And the source is you. That you is a construct of massive, Self-reference. The brain actually creates five or six of these self-reference constructs. For example, from all of the millions of point moments of contact with the surface of your hide, the brain creates a you that's embodied, a you that's defined as coming to the limits of your skin. If you think of the you that relates to the, the interpreter of what you see in the world in front of you, you would locate that you immediately behind your eyes, somewhere in the center of your head, massively self-referencing every moment of seeing to the source of the seeing, and the source of the seeing plastically constructed on a massive scale is you. Now, one of the beautiful things about this process is that you very readily incorporate other things that are really important to you into that you. The construction of the person that you are is actually designed for attachment. Because of its powers, we very readily incorporate anything else that's really valuable or important to us within ourselves, and they become part of us. The mother becomes part of the person that is the child, and the child the mother. Two friends, two great friends, literally become a part of one another. 
We're constructed to be social creatures on a powerful level to be attached. Whenever everything goes well, this is an incredibly powerful gift for us in our operations in the world. We're designed to be, we're designed to be unified and integrated with one another. Actually constructed to be integrated with one another. Now I want to talk about a key aspect of this plasticity before I talk about its practical extensions. And in this, I specifically want to talk about a rather remarkable aspect of it. And that is to say that the processes of change in the brain are almost unbelievably reversible. We begin to appreciate this initially about 25 years ago when we were doing very early plasticity experiments. And we realized that plasticity followed what we call a Hebbian rule. It turns out Donald Hebb was a Canadian psychologist, a wonderful scientist, who postulated how change must be in order to account for the evolution of behavior in brains. And his great principle was is that you could account for so much if you just believed that the brain was organizing itself on the basis of coincident activities. The way he would put it would be things that fire together or excited together wire together moment by moment in time. We call this the Hebbian plasticity model, and we realized very early on in studies that were conducted in animal models that the brain appeared to be following this great principle. Things that fire together, wire together. Now, it turns out that there's an important fundamental implication of that fact. And the fundamental implication is, is that it's very easy to organize a training activity so that you can drive the brain in a refining or improving direction that strengthens your ability or that degrades it. So, for example, we relatively rapidly saw that in an animal or a human, we could take something like the effective use of a hand and beautifully elaborate it and improve its powers. Or we could change the form of training and, and very, very rapidly turn the hand into a useless claw. I could take any one of you, and I could relatively rapidly refine the accuracy with which you hear what I say. I could take any one of you, and within an equivalent period of time, degrade your ability to understand, and ultimately completely destroy your ability to understand what I say. Plasticity is actually involves two-way processes, you could say. Now, it turns out that, that, that there's a very good reason for this, which I'm going to get to. Before I get to that, I just want to say that we've recently elaborated these, this understanding by very richly studying the brains of animals and humans at different stages of life. We began by looking at the brain of a rat or the brain of a human when they're in the prime of life. And we looked at about 20 different great functional or physical characteristics of the brain in the prime of life. And we distinguished them, make all of the same measurements in all of the same ways, in animals or humans that are nearer the end of life. And the first question we ask is, of these 20 large functional operations in the brain, or physical aspects or attributes of a brain, which involve hundreds of known cellular and molecular processes, very complex business, how many of these things are different in the brains of an animal near the end of life versus the brain of an animal in the prime of life? And the simple answer is, everything's different. Everything we measure, every aspect, physically, functionally, chemically, of the brain of an older animal or an older human differs very significantly from the brain of an animal in the prime of life. And then the second question we ask is, well, how many of these things actually advantage the older brain? Now, we know that there's an advantage to an older brain that's critical uh, to the role that older people play in society. Can you imagine a wartime Britain being led by a 20-year-old Winston Churchill? With age, comes accumulated knowledge. And from the manipulation of the knowledge across time, 
becomes the distillation of conclusions that we might call, that we do call, wisdom. So in this respect, older is better. But in all of the 20 things that we looked at that related to the operational brain, old is never better. Old is slower. Older is less accurate. Older is less reliable. Older is deteriorating physically in all kinds of ways. Older is changing chemically in all kinds of ways that can only be described as negative or destructive changes. And now we come to the real experiment. And the real experiment is to say, well, how many of these things that distinguish the older brain are reversible? How many of these things can we drive back into a more youthful word direction? So we can say we sent these older individuals to rehab. <laughs> and in the case of humans, they actually went to internet training. In the case of animals, they actually went to training on computer guided, in a computer guided, guided environment. So the question is how many of these things that define the, the older deteriorated brain can actually be rejuvenated? And the simple answer is all of them. Every physical, every functional, every chemical aspect that would define the brain as aging can be driven far back in the direction of the brain in the prime of life. So I want, want to just describe a few of those things that we measured. First of all, we saw the brain discovered, recovered its discriminative powers. We can see that it almost completely recovers its operations at speed. No longer pokey, no longer slow at every operational level. It recovers its higher precision analytical machinery. The physical machinery of the brain, of the brain itself is actually rejuvenated. It looks like the machinery in the young brain. It changes its chemistry in a whole series of ways to be more like that of a young brain. It revitalizes a key brain cell population that controls the selectivity of operations in the brain, a particular class of inhibitory neurons in the brain that we know go to blazes in older, older age. It recovers its ability to suppress intrusive distractions, something that really plagues older brains and older individuals. It quiets down. Noise level comes down to a level, you could say, the chatter in the brain comes down to a level like the level you see in a younger brain. It recovers its ability to operate in a noisy environment, and on and on and on. Everything we look at, we see the brain substantially rejuvenated by relatively simple forms of training. Of course, it does matter how you train, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a minute. Now, here's a very simple example, and I just chose one of many from a human study. And we look at an aspect of what we call speed of processing in the brain, and here we're looking at speed of processing in individuals as a function of age. And we're moving from, from approximately 20 years of age on the left. So on the left side of this panel in the green are individuals between 20 and 40. And then we're moving towards the individuals of an older old age to the right. And in the red, we have individuals between the ages of 70 and 90. And you can see by the black line, the average speed of processing for an individual, what's being measured, is the speed at which an individual can take in a little brief piece of sound and correctly identify it, followed by another piece of sound, and identify that second sound as well. This is how fast the brain can sample information that's coming in in the sound domain. Now, if you don't think that's important, well, think what happens as the sounds and language flow by. And it's a real advantage to be two or three times faster in this ability when you're young as opposed to when you're aged. That's a real difference. And you see these differences of speed of processing reflected in all kinds of operations in brain that compromise the slow pokes and advantage the speed balls. You might see that a big difference in the older population versus the young is that there's greater variation in ability. All of the individuals that are circled in the dashed red box are judged to be normal. Yet some of them are like the 20-year-olds. Others are really struggling. And now we train the individuals at this ability, not at this ability, but other abilities that we know impact speed of processing. We train about 216 of them, and the performance of all of them after they're trained fall within this blue box. 
So we've actually trained them on the statistical average to be superior to the average 20-year-old or 30-year-old. We see exactly the same thing in equivalent studies in animals. Some abilities we're able to drive all the way back to a performance level that matches the performance level of a young brain, or better. And in fact, in some of these abilities, we have to train the young brain to be equivalent in performance. Now, it's important to understand that this is an ability that's fundamental to many operations in the brain. You could think of it as an implicit ability that many other things depend on. It has to be recovered. It has to, you have to be concerned about it to increase all of the greater powers that are the real target. Because what we're really interested in is improving the operations of the complex things we do with our brains in real life, of course. And we know that if we improve this ability in the right way, it is one of those things that contributes to increasing those greater powers on a highly significant level of transferring those gains, you could say, to improving a real life. Now, we've actually trained many abilities in older brains, or you could say in brains of any age. And what we see is a universal ability, independent of age, to derive very strong improvements at any age. So this is a very complicated image. We can look at it for about an hour and probably just think about slitting our wrist. <laughs> but what I show here is eight. I could, have showed, I could show you 50 of these things, in which we've trained several thousand individuals of different ages. And what distinguishes these numbers in these different bins are simply coming to the point in this study, which is all, this is all training, using training tools on the internet, what you see in the red dots are the performance before training. And you can see that the younger individual is generally better. So here's the younger individual, and down is good here. And the bottom panels, I might say, up is good. So down is, down is good here. And you can see as an older age, you get poorer and poorer at it. But everybody trained gets substantially better. This is with an equivalent period of training. Now, of course, if we were older, we would train this individual longer because the goal would be to drive them in a longer period of time down, down farther and farther towards the younger performance. But even with this training, what the horizontal bars represent is an extension from the 60-year-olds to the 20-year-olds. And look what happens. When you're in a divided attention task, when you're trained, the 60-year-old is better than the untrained 20-year-old. So here's the untrained 20-year-old, here's the trained 20-year-old. Of course, they're better than the 60 -year -old, trained 60-year-old. But you have to train the 20-year-old to come to the performance level of the 60-year-old. We see this over and over again. You can see that in most of these panels, when you train the 60-year-old in these elemental abilities, the 60-year-old is equal to or better than the untrained 20-year-old. Of course, these are large, from large statistical populations, and there's substantial variation in these abilities. But I want you to take away two messages from this. One is, is that it's all plastic. You name the ability, and you can drive improvements of it independent of age. The second thing is, look at the performance gains that acquire as a function of age. Are older brains incapable of learning or advancing? Are they somehow stuck in a rut and not able to advance or rejuvenate? Just simply not true. In ability after ability after ability, they can be driven in an improving direction. Now, the last message about from these studies is that these changes reflect physical and chemical changes in brains. These don't come out of nothing. The brain is actually changing itself, not just functionally in this respect but it's actually changing itself as a physical operating machine as a consequence of this engagement. So how do you turn an old or impaired brain into what appears to be a physically and functionally or more capable younger one? Well, you can just train it. Of course, it matters how you train it. So then, a second question arises from these studies. How can you turn a brain in the prime of life into an old one? What's happening there? Why does it go to blazes? It turns out this is a very, very simple thing to do. All you need to do is to just add noise. And by noise, I mean chatter in the brain. You need to manipulate the brain so that now there's an increased background of chatter that degrades the resolving power of the brain. 
when you degrade the resolving power of the brain, it has to change its operational characteristics to sustain a level of control. You can think about it in a very simple way. I'm out in the evening. I'm looking across the meadow. I say, well, what's that I see by the wood? And I have to look longer to be sure because the conditions, the signal to noise conditions that apply for my operations are compromised because of the poor conditions in vision. And so there are poor conditions in the brain in resolving what's important to it, the signal, from the unimportant things, the chatter, the background, the noise. What happens is that the brain, all I have to do is to add to that chatter in an appropriate way. And if I do that for three or four or five or six months in an animal, we have to do these experiments much more precautiously in humans. We have to make sure that everything we do in a human is reversible. But we know we see exactly the same thing. We can drive in any little ability, the brain in a degrading condition, by the equivalent of just adding noise. Now, one of the interesting things from this experiment <laughs> is the realization that given the fact that these processes are reversible from the middle of life, when you're really at your peak, going forward is equivalent to going backward. In other words, wondrously, when you look at the operational characteristics of a brain near the end of life, because the processes involved are reversible, the brain is very much like the brain of a child that's had almost no experience. The child, after all, comes out of the noise and organizes the activity of the brain, you could say, in increasing fidelity and power and clarity, reaches a peak, and then the noise begins to creep in and the whole process moves backward in the same direction from whence it come. Very old is equivalent, operationally, to be very young. So why would it be reversible? What's this all about? Well, the brain is actually controlling change, its plasticity, on the basis of outcomes. What controls whether it changes or not is whether it gets the answer right. And what it, this is all about is assuring that every brain is doing the best job it can of getting the answer right. Our survival is dependent upon getting the answer right. So what the brain basically is up to is making the best out of circumstances at each point in life to help it get the answer right with greatest reliability. It advances when it can. When you get the right answer right consistently, it moves forward, it goes faster. It refines its operation. It becomes more and more selective and elaborate. But as soon as it starts failing, it relaxes its characteristics. Again, so that, like looking at the deer across the wood, it has a better chance of actually identifying what's happening. Now, it turns out that anyone, their brain, can substantially control with this understanding whether they go backward or forward. It's up to you. My recommendation, really, this is serious, I mean this, choose forward. <laughs> so what's the source of all of that chatter, that brain noise and aging? Well, there are a lot of sources. We grow up in a, a life in which we acquire all kinds of abilities and a close attendant in our childlike period, more childish period of life as we grow our powers. And then we, more and more, live on, with, on automatic pilot. We're paying relatively little attention in the complex worlds that we're operating in to the details of the things around us. Instead of engaging in the world in a physical way, we refine ourselves for many hours every day. The est estimated period of time is 11 hours, sitting on our keisters, but basically our body out of action. The only thing that we're actually moving is like little robots, are these things. What a waste. We spend great periods of time receiving information, but not really acting on it except emotionally. 11 hours a day in my country per person looking at a screen. Unbelievable, really. We pave even the path in the countryside so that every footfall is certain, so that there can never be any really significant variability or challenge to anything that happens to us as we move across the physical environment. 
even when things really remarkable might walk right in front of us. We're so disengaged <laughs> that we might not even notice. I call this, this the, the period of the modern zombie, sleepwalking through life. You know, I notice this in my own daily walk. I walk across my city every morning for about 45 minutes. And it's really surprising to me now when I see somebody that's actually in an interactive human mode or paying any attention to the environment across which they're moving. Most people are so wrapped up internally in thought or in some form of mind wandering. They're so disengaged. We have all of these strategies that we've adopted in altering our environments so that we can actually live life without the use of much of a brain. <laughs> so you can think of brain, or your life, of the average modern human as like a roller coaster. You come out of the noise, you organize activities in the brain, and you come to some peak on the average in humans, modern human, in the third or fourth decade of life. Women last a little longer on the peak than men because they have hormonal advantages. And they have other advantages as well, but we won't go into that. It's unfair that they should have more genetic material, but... <laughs> but even then, when they do begin to slide, they rapidly catch up with the old guys. <laughs> but in the latter half of life, where most of us on the statistical average are rolling back downhill. This doesn't really have to happen on that, this way. There is a better path. And the better path was understanding that you have the power to change your brain operationally for the better is to try to drive the brain in a growing, continuously growing and upward direction as long as you can. Now, we've tried to bring this, these processes under control by harnessing the genie, you could say. And we deliver strategies to try to drive the brain to improve primarily by using modern technology, even while modern technology paradoxically is a big part of the problem. But there are great powers in using it to drive change under beautiful control. So we've conducted platforms for achieving the, the delivery of these targeted programs on computers, pads, and on smartphones. The training is adaptive so that it quickly adjusts to the performance abilities of anyone, almost anybody of any ability. They're optimized because we understand how to optimize training so that the training is very highly efficient. We can drive large-scale changes. You could say like driving the changes that would enable a kid that can't read to read in anybody. A person like Todd Sampson even though smart as he was, very highly significant changes in a narrow window of time. The changes are targeted that broadly recover key abilities. They're extensive because in many instances, for example, in the decline into ultimate infirmity, senility, lots of things are going bad, you could say, that have to be dealt with by recovery. We embed assessments so that you document, we document what's changing, we do have conducted many, many studies involving thousands of subjects to demonstrate that this, the, these training strategies are effective and that the impacts generalize to real life. We can deliver the training in a clinically monitored way, and we commonly do that when a clinical indication is in play. And that training is scalable. It's easy to access, and it's relatively inexpensive. Now, an important aspect of the use of this training strategy at a site we call Brain Age 2 is that we provide a basis for a person for self-evaluation. So you can say you can go to this site, and there's a myriad of things you can do, several hundred. And of those several hundred things you would do, each one of them measures your performance ability each time you do it. And it can calibrate you in relation to the rest of the human race. Now here I've set this, and this is my own little performance. You can see that in my, I'm on the, these things that are represented here, I was at the 87th percentile. I'm 72 years of age. I could obviously move the age down and compare myself with 20-year-olds. And then I would drop to about the 70th percentile. I can obviously, obviously want to improve that. I have improved that. I haven't shown you my current data. This is about three years old. I have improved that. So now in what these things, I would be in, in the 99th percentile. But you can calibrate yourself across time, not just on the basis of what you're doing, you could say, in the brain gym, but what, you, what else, other things that you're doing in life? Because you must do other things in life. Can't be limited to this. Once you understand that your brain is plastic, you have to think about lifestyle changes, not just brain gym engagement. 
So my time is up, but I just want to say that I just want to emphasize, and I'll certainly talk about, for those people that attend my workshop tomorrow, we'll talk about those other ways to engage your brain. You obviously have to engage it in the right form of brain-guided physical activities. You actually have to work often at quieting the noise in other ways, intensifying your personal focus. In mindfulness or other training is a very, very good idea. Engaging your brain in continuous new learning is really new. Not just new learning in the sense of learn, reading another book or doing something that you've always, uh, that always oper operate with mastery. Reconnecting mind and body, real world social exercise, and living a joyful life. And if you do all of these things together, your brain will thank you. And in a well managed life, the health of your brain and of you is, of course, should be an important ongoing consideration for how you live that life. Your brain is you. You've been given a great gift. You have the power within you to be a stronger, better, more effective person next week, next month, next year, as compared to what you are today. You have the power within you to continue to grow. Or take the alternative. Live your, and witness yourself in decline. I strongly suggest you choose growth. Thank you very much. By the time we're 60, more than 90% of us will have known someone close to us who has suffered from some sort of a neurological disorder. You all know you're not going to live forever. There's only one way into this life and one way out. I cannot prove to you anymore that anything is possible. Talk about the marvelous thing that we now understand about our brains. It gets so much better.